Hi there. Today we will discuss brand equity strategy. Let's jump in. First of all, we should consider what is a brand. Now, a brand, as most of us should be familiar with, is any name, term, design, or symbol uh, or any other particular feature that identifies one firm or seller's goods or service as distinct from other sellers. And a brand represents a resource to the firm. The reason it represents a resource to the firm, one that um, is able to be distinguishable and uh, specific to a particular firm is because it represents a form of a legal resource in the sense that you can uh, have a registered trademark by uh, going through the patent process. You can have a unregistered trademark that um, you know a company says, okay, we are going through the trademark process, but we haven't uh, been able to get registered yet. And then sometimes you have unregistered service trademarks. Um, probably what we're most familiar with seeing is that registered trademark or even the unregistered trademark symbols on packaging. Uh, for registered trademarks, we're probably all familiar with seeing this with major brands like Starbucks, Coca-Cola, because um, most of them have registered their trademark with the U.S. Patent Office. Now, for some newer brands um, that haven't had a chance to go through that entire lengthy process, oftentimes they would have that TM to signify that uh, it is a trademark, but currently it is unregistered. It also represents a uh, relational resource in the sense that um, the brand itself represents a way of uh, a relationship with competitors. Uh, it has representations to employees and then a brand also has representations to customers. So um, customers, employees and competitors, they can uh, obtain value from uh, from these trademarks these uh, brands they can say okay well this brand it's very established uh, it's been around for a long time uh, customers trust it uh, these brands represent a relational resource to uh, to both competitors employees and customers so uh, one of the things that we can use to assess brands uh, based on their valuation is uh, interbrand and interbrand is a uh, a website it's a service that uh, that's a method that you can find online and they started in 1988 they uh, provide a methodology for evaluating brands and they evaluate brands off of three criteria one is financial forecast the other is the role of the brand and then also the brand strength and that provides the brand value within each of these components financial forecast role of brand and brand strength there are components which is what we're going to cover next uh, we can look at the financial forecast these uh, have to do with the financial return provided to investors from the brand and uh, the role of brand is it has to do with the portion of purchase decisions that can be attributed to the brand in particular, rather than other factors like price, convenience, uh, packaging, the features of the product. Uh, it has to do with the brand itself. So uh, Interbrand has come out with a come up with a methodology that they can kind of parcel out uh, these other factors rather than um, Focusing on those, they can focus on just the uh, aspects related to the brand itself. So whenever we're thinking of uh, brand strength, the next criteria, we can think of internal factors that have to be involved in evaluating the brand strength. These are clarity. We can also have responsiveness, governance, and finally commitment. And these are internal factors that the brand uh, represents so how clear uh, the brand is for target audiences um, the responsiveness to changes in the market the governance relates to the uh, how 
the board, how the company is uh, being effective in their uh, brand strategy. And then finally, the commitment is uh, internal commitment to their uh, employees and internal commitment to uh, their beliefs and values. We can also have some external factors, and these have to do with engagement, relevance, authenticity, consistency, differentiation, and finally presence. So most of us are probably familiar with the terms engagement because we've seen that uh, in the digital marketing space, how well the brand engages with customers, uh, how relevant the brand is in consumers' everyday lives, how authentic that brand is, if they can uh, be trustworthy and capable of what they say they're going to do, if they're consistent, most of us are uh, pretty familiar with the concept of uh, being consistent. If they're able to differentiate between other brands and uh, also the presence, <clears throat> which refers to how, um, how often you see that brand and how, how often people are talking about that brand in their everyday lives. So uh, the difference between presence and relevance is relevance is how important that brand is to consumers, whereas presence is how often it's being talked about and uh, being displayed uh, to other customers. We also can focus on the inclusion criteria of these brands, and it's important whenever Interbrand uh, conducts this methodology and rates these brands that they have specific inclusion criteria. One is that the brand has to be global, uh, that means that 30% of their revenue comes outside of the brand's home region. So if the brand is located in the United States, they have to derive 30% of their revenue from outside of the United States. And they also have to have a significant presence in different countries, so Asia, Europe, North America. They would have to cover uh, these main markets, but then they would also have to cover uh, geographic area in emerging markets. Emerging markets would be like India, um, Brazil might also be considered like an emerging market. We also have to be uh, tri transparent with financial results. That's why uh, with this, Typically, they focus on uh, companies who are publicly traded, and uh, publicly traded, obviously, their data is available, so they can assess that financial performance, just like you assess um, financial performance measures for your particular companies, they can assess that using the 10K reports provided by like the SEC. They also have to be profitable. So a lot of companies, right, we're familiar with like Tesla, that they haven't been profitable in, uh, in some years. And so uh, with Interbrand, they look for companies that uh, are profitable, that they can see uh, positive returns over the long term. And finally, the brand has to be visible. With that, uh, it has to have some type of public profile and there's sufficient awareness not just like in a particular geographic region, but across uh, major economies of the world. So like they should have a visibility in Europe, they should be known in Asia, they should be known in North America. People should know about that brand. So we can see this is from 2017 to 2019. These are the top five brands. I could have looked at more, but I just wanted to show you here that uh, whenever we think of in 2017 to 2019, Apple and Google have pretty well been at the top for the past uh, past three years. We can also see that Microsoft used to be uh, number three, however, they shifted to number four, and Amazon used to be number five, however, they shifted to number three, and Coca-Cola shifted to number five. So there are some changes over time where these brands that uh, they, are, they are being evaluated and they change. Uh, so obviously Interbrand has to reconduct their evaluations. Now it may be surprising to you that Amazon wasn't, uh, wasn't at the top of the list, but uh, it should be no surprise that you know Apple and Google and Amazon and uh, these five companies that they are at the top of Interbrand's valuation list. So we've 
really covered that consumers place value in a brand, right? That uh, there's all these different criteria, the external factors that Interbrand looks at whenever they're evaluating different brands. And uh, customers that they focus on things like authenticity, responsiveness, engagement, uh, that all of these things are uh, really associate with how consumers value that brand and how, uh, how strong the, the value uh, in general is of the brand overall. And so whenever we're talking about equity, we're talking about value, what the value is associated with a particular brand. And most models of brand equity show value is derived from uh, some type of consumer perceptions, and that is customer-based brand equity. So we can focus on one where brand equity is uh, from the consumer standpoint as they look at, okay, how loyal are customers to the brand? How, uh, how aware customers are of the brand? So that's like brand presence. What the quality is of the brand? What associations the uh, customer has in their minds about the brand? And then other uh, aspects of brand assets. Now there's a m other model that's much uh, simpler, but is also based on brand equity. And that has to do with uh, brand awareness. So how aware customers are of that brand and the image uh, customers have of the brand in their mind. Now, we're all pretty familiar of uh, every customer probably has a little bit different perceptions of the brand in their mind. Like we could talk about Starbucks. You could have one uh, individual who thinks, oh, Starbucks is like a pretentious, uh, snobby brand, whereas others may think of Starbucks as, oh, they're really inclusive and they uh, try to promote social issues and they're really uh, doing a great job. They're, uh, they're a great company. We, we believe that they're, uh, they're so good and they're such a great brand. So you can have various uh, views of what a brand represents uh, between different individuals. So brand knowledge uh, these associations in one's mind uh, is definitely really important on how we uh, as customers value that brand and the value associated with that brand uh, across large groups of consumer segments. So whenever we're talking about brand equity strategy, the important thing here is obviously we're focused on competitive advantage, we're focused on superior financial performance, and how firms are able to do this is by acquiring, developing, nurturing, leveraging uh, high equity brands. So brands that have a large or high amount of value in the eyes of the consumer and in the eyes of other, other potential customers, right? If we're a B2B firm, our customer is uh, other businesses. So if we're a big brand like Salesforce, um, the equity associated with our brands is in the mind of our clients, in the mind of our business, other business uh, customers who purchase from us. So we as firms, whenever we're looking to uh, focus on our brand equity strategy, we have to uh, really focus on the value associated with our brand and how we can uh, enhance that value over time and uh, maintain a position of competitive advantage. So we're going to talk a little bit about brand equity strategy here and uh, go into some of the details. So how do we build brand equity? Obviously, we have to have uh, internal efforts and internal efforts by I'm, what I mean by that is we have to uh, work with our employees to show them that the value associated with our brand uh, comes from the internal efforts that we are doing as a company. So uh, everybody's on the same page and everybody's working together to increase the value of that brand. Additionally, uh, the brand identity has to come through in all aspects of the marketing mix. So. Uh, if we portray ourselves to be an honest company, a fair company, um, a company that represents quality, we would want to portray that image not only in our prices, 
but uh, in the products that we sell, the services we provide, uh, potentially like our packaging, the places we provide it, uh, our promotional efforts, we want it to be an integrated effort. So with that, we have these brand contacts and brand contacts represent uh, any experience, either a customer, a prospect, or even the public has with the brand itself. So we're going to talk a lot about these brand contacts and how important they are for building brand equity. This is a nice schematic of what building brand equity looks like. We have a brand identity that we have to, as a company, determine what is our identity? What do we represent? What do we want to represent? And with this, we have brand identity contacts that are uh, presenting what we want to represent in our integrated marketing communication strategy. We're going to talk a lot about IMC in future chapters, but the key here is that uh, these are all of our promotional efforts. So any type of promotion that we're doing, our promotion strategy, we have to have our brand identity represented in the promotions that are being put out to uh, our customers, to the public, and to uh, our clients. So with that, any promotional efforts, there's obviously contacts involved in that, right? If uh, one customer sees our advertisement and they are really like, oh wow, this company, this brand, they're doing a really great job, um, let me tell you about it. Obviously, uh, the way we have now as influencers, we have people who, they, if they like a brand and they wanna show off, uh, that brand, even if they're not trying to be like a, or if they're not like a paid influencer, they can, uh, in very small ways, influence their, uh, their close friends and family. Just by posting simply, uh, say for example, you're on a ski trip and you have a North Face jacket. It's those little subtle things that while you may not even be thinking that you're influencing your friends and family by your clothing choices, you definitely are. So whenever we, we're going to talk about each of these particular aspects, but what I want you to keep in mind is throughout all of this, there are changes that are happening in the environment and that also affects uh, how customers perceive the brand identity, um, our promotional efforts, and then the value of our brands over time. So with this, we can connect this by saying that brand identity strategy, how we come up with our brand, what our brand represents to customers, it informs, it guides, and it helps develop, nurture, and implement our IMC strategy. So how we're going to promote ourselves to our customers, because we don't want to represent, us, represent ourselves as a company in a way that's counter to what we're trying to represent as a company, right? So brand identity really goes hand in hand with how a company develops their uh, promotional or integrated marketing communication strategy. And with that, our promotional strategy, our IMC strategy commits to, contributes to the firm's brand equity. And then IMC, strat, IMC strategy and brand identity uh, helps build or influence our overall brand equity strategy. So that is kind of the, um, the process that it goes through as brand identity affects our promotional efforts and our promotional efforts then affect how consumers value our brand over time. So the key here, whenever we're thinking about, right, we saw the brand identity contacts and we saw brand equity contacts. Brand identity contacts are those that are between the brand strategists. So these might be like the uh, CMO, the CEO, they may have strategies that they want to implement associated with the brand. You know, we have the uh, chief executive, the C-suite, that they come up with the mission, the vision, uh, and even like for Starbucks, they have guiding principles. So these are all the uh, individuals who are coming up with what they want to represent to um, the 
the outside world, basically, and also to their employees. The brand stewards are any internal or external entities that communicate that brand identity to customers, to the prospects, and to public. With that, uh, obviously, that, that would be basically any of your employees. Uh, anybody that you hire, like for example, this could also be a paid influencer, anybody that you pay to uh, promote your, uh, your brand to the outside world is a brand steward. And then obviously we have brand equity contacts and these are uh, any interactions that are between the brand stewards and the customers, prospects and public. So with the brand identity contacts, the key here is communication between those internal to the company and those uh, you know, that are developing what the brand represents and those who are going to be discussing the brand with the outside world. The brand equity contacts are those interactions that occur between the brand stewards, those who are going to put out that information to the world and any particular uh, individual in the outside world that has any type of concern with the brand. So obviously from a big picture perspective, marketing, we, ha we have as a, uh, a firm an impact on the outside world. This is like uh, Starbucks, whenever we talk about their guiding principles, they believe in uh, ethical sourcing of their products, for example. And so they believe that it's important to um, to focus on not only social issues, but also being um, socially aware and being um, ethical in everything that they attempt to do. So from this perspective, we have to think of this uh, big picture brand management. And with brand management, we're managing those brand equity contacts we're also managing those brand identity contacts. And from this, we can have a brand management capability. So these are all the systems, the processes used to develop, grow, maintain, and leverage a firm's brand assets. So our brand equity strategy uh, is really important. How we're going to um, get our brand to have strong and high brand equity. And then we can have a brand management capability where uh, those involved in this, this could be like a marketing manager, that they have to manage these different contacts. And managing this, these contacts is no easy feat, obviously, uh, because we have customer service representatives who are on the front line, who interact with customers on an everyday basis. And those interactions, even uh, the way that that customer service representative is representing themselves to the customer, uh, impacts brand equity. So brand management capability is very difficult to even, um, even have, but obviously firms do better at it than others. Some firms do. So there could be some issues with brand equity strategy, and one is uh, brand reinforcement. With that, these are activities that ensures that the brand equity of a particular brand doesn't diminish or depreciate with time. We could also have brand revitalization. This is really important as a brand matures during their, uh, their life cycle. So obviously, uh, sometimes brands, they go through a process of decline, right? We've seen this where uh, companies like Sears right now are, they're going through a major decline. JC Penney, uh, for example, has been going through a major decline. And so uh, these brands, they could attempt to do something about this and have a rebirth, or they could continue declining to uh, the death of their brand and go out of business completely. But brand revitalization are the efforts at trying to revive that brand to a rebirth um, type period. We could also have co-branding. And I want you to think about co-branding for a second because there is a, a co-branding effort that you should be very familiar with uh, because it's been very present in, uh, in your life. If you think about this is fast food related, 
Um, it's it's you probably are super familiar with this, and whenever I mention it, the Doritos Loco Taco from Taco Bell. Uh, most of us have probably seen this. It's uh, it's very common, but there's a ton of co-branding efforts that occur uh, between brands, and that's great um, because these brands they can work together to create a very unique product offering. We can also have ingredient branding, and most of you may not be familiar with ingredient branding, but ingredient branding um, is pretty present in our everyday lives. This is like uh, whenever you purchase a computer, you have particular brands that are within that computer, right? You can see the picture there that shows, okay, you have an Intel core processor. Intel is a brand, uh, the core, represents a brand from Intel, it's a trademark. Then we have the Windows uh, Microsoft Office Suite, we have the uh, Windows um, operating system, and we could have uh, graphics chips. So all of these are different ingredients that make up a, uh, a product itself. And so we could have uh, other uh, products that we could think about like this also that I'll encourage you to think in your mind what other types of products use ingredient branding. And then finally, we could have uh, retro branding. And this occurred with like the Ford Bronco that was recently released, that they're uh, relaunching a historical brand and uh, providing that with updated features. And it's really a great if a brand can do this because like Ford Bronco, all those who are big Bronco fans, 25, 30 years ago, they're hyped up about getting a new Bronco and the potential of what that Bronco uh, could mean for them because it's kind of like they're reliving their youth in a way. A lot of people who had purchased Broncos or had Broncos 25, 30 years ago, uh, obviously 30 years ago, they may have been 20 years old or they may have been 25 years old. And so with that, uh, they're kind of like reliving their youth by having a new updated version of their favorite car that they used to have that uh, they can now uh, relive some of those experiences. So these are some issues. We also have other issues in brand equity strategy. One is managing global brands. Obviously, there's different perceptions around the world about different brands. So uh, the perceptions of customers in Europe may be completely different uh, from perceptions of customers in North America, even for the same brand. So having to manage the brand equity globally is very difficult uh, because like, let's say for instance, Starbucks in Europe, they may think that Starbucks isn't that great, obviously because Italy, they have their own coffee scene. So there they may say, oh, Starbucks, uh, that isn't good coffee. That's just, that's kind of like trash, for example. So different customers can have very different perceptions and these can differ very substantially uh, geographically. This even occurs like in the Northeast, you have those who uh, are very particular about like Duncan, whereas in other areas, they're very particular about Starbucks. Now, we can also have brand crises. This can occur through firestorms, negative word of mouth, and uh, also there's uh, the support from other customers that were, okay, if a brand does something wrong, they're gonna get called out for it now. And we have obviously these uh, customers who are, it's very easy for them to, um, to uh, put up a brand and tell, the, tell people about their negative experience with a brand because it's so easy to put it out there in the world today. So dealing with brand crises is much more difficult today than it was even say five, 10 years ago because of the <clears throat> such presence of online media. We also have uh, the concept of brand extensions. We're all pretty familiar with this because brand extensions occur pretty regularly, especially for popular brands. Um, these have forward spillover effects. So the original product can have an influence on new products because of the brand name. And then reciprocal spillover effects when the new product can uh, help the success of the original product. So like 
for example, we could think about this in the toothpaste space where Crest, uh, they, their original product was toothpaste. They uh, extended their product line to focus on also uh, mouthwash and the white strips. And so these products also benefited their toothpaste, but the toothpaste brand Crest benefited their mouthwash and their white strips. Uh, Starbucks has also benefited from this by their um, uh, products that they used to not sell at convenience stores, right? They used to not package their Starbucks um, drinks, especially like, okay, the uh, double espresso shot. I know that's come out pretty recently, the canned coffee. Well, they used to not have that, right? But they did have the Frappuccino in the glass uh, containers that you could purchase. And so those Frappuccinos, for example, the Starbucks uh, helped the espresso shots and even just the regular Starbucks brand. And these double espresso uh, shots also um, improved regular Starbucks sales. So these uh, product line extensions, these brand extensions can be very beneficial for a company and that's why a lot of companies use it. So this is a, a lot of information about brand equity strategy. If you have questions about brand equity strategy, I encourage you to email me at kt.manus at ttu.edu. Thanks. Bye-bye.